In this lecture, we are going to look at Islamic architecture in China. <clears throat> Islam was created um, in the seventh century and flourished in the uh, eighth century and the ninth century. So during these two centuries, it you know, originated in the Arabian Peninsula. It conquered much of the uh, world, you know, in from the Middle East, it expanded to um, North Africa, uh, conquered Central Asia, and conquered Spain, um, and uh, um, the Muslim army reached as far as the border of China um, <clears throat> in the eighth century. So the rise of Islam was contemporary to the Chinese Tang Dynasty. So, uh, but in this lecture, we are going to look at um, Chinese Islamic architecture um, from, you know, the whole imperial period. Um, so we group all the Islamic um, architecture in this lecture. So we are not restricted um, by the chronolo chronology of Tang Dynasty. Um, but uh, I think after introducing the history up to Tang, now it is the time to introduce a, um, a interesting and um, kind of a unique um, topic in Chinese architecture. That is um, the architecture of Islam in China. <clears throat> now, the <clears throat> Islamic world um, was very significant. We typically divide the old world, old world meaning, um, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa. Um, these are the old world before uh, Christopher Columbus discovery in quotation mark of the Americas. So for the old world, it was typical to classify a East and a West. In the first century, for example, in the East was the Han Dynasty, the Han Empire, and in the West was the Roman Empire. So in the 7th century to 9th century, a huge empire was founded by the Arabs that is sandwiched in between the classical East and West. So this area would be unified under the Arabic empire, and that is the the caliphate, right? The caliphate, um, the Umayyad caliphate, the Abbasid caliphate. Uh, so it is <coughs> a big world in between East and West. It is also the part of the world where the so-called Silk, Silk Road passed. We know the Silk Road connect east and west. It passed, you know, the majority of the Silk Road go through the, this area in between. So it's a significant area. But today, of course, we are going to look at how that region, how the uh, religion originated from that area influence um, Chinese architecture. Um, <clears throat> first, there were interaction between the Arabic Empire and the Tang Chinese Empire. There was a battle fought between the Abbasid Muslim army and the Tang Chinese army in Central Asia in the mid 8th century at a location called Talas. And during that battle, 
the Tang army were defeated. However, the Abbasid army were also, the Muslim army were also kind of a, um, exhausted. So uh, further expansion of Islam was, was stopped somewhere there in, at the border of you know, the Western region of China. So there were interaction, early interaction. And uh, maybe you know, during that war, um, the Chinese soldiers captured by the Arabs were took to, um, to Baghdad and uh, to, um, to um, the Middle East. And that, that spread some technology um, and all vice versa. You know, there were also, um, you know, information uh, from that remote land um, became known in China. But most, more importantly, <clears throat> maybe more than those occasional war, merchant had long been traveling the Silk Road and they were spreading different religions. So when Islam uh, rose on the Arabian Peninsula, so the merchants also kind of brought those information there. There were Muslim merchants traveling the Silk Road um, as well. Um, well, um, you know, into the second millennium CE uh, when Silk Road uh, was replaced by the maritime Silk Road. So these are the kind of a um, historical background for you to understand the relationship between China and Islam, right? Tang Dynasty, this is the Umayyad Dynasty, the first Islamic dynasty. They are contemporaries. And the Song Dynasty, China, and Abbasid Islamic Empire, they ended <clears throat> with, during the same period because they were both destroyed by the Mongols, right? Eventually, the Mongols from the Mongolian Priory conquered both the Song China and the Abbasid <coughs> Middle East. So the Mongols were very, um, a very important um, force in the medieval world. They founded the Yuan Dynasty in China which was from 1271 to 1368. They conquered a huge land, you know, including the Middle East. And that was the 13th century. The Middle East being conquered by the Mongols was a Muslim Middle East already. So <clears throat> in the 13th century, in another, wor in another word, one could travel from Baghdad all the way to Beijing we, without any kind of visa because that is kind of under one huge Mongol empire. And it was during Yuan Dynasty, Marco Polo, <coughs> someone from Italy went to China. And the reason is because with the vast empire, the travel was relatively easy because you don't need to pass from one national border to another. It was basically just one big empire. Um, so the, the 13th century was a period when that kind of international traveling was actually facilitated by the creation of the huge Mongol empire that later split into four empires, the Yuan China, the, um, the Chaktai Central Asia, 
the Iran, Iran and Iraq, and the、uh, the Canid of Golden Horde of Eastern Europe and the、um, uh, Southern Siberia, right? So that include Mo Moscow, Moscow, Russia was under the Mongol Golden Golden Horde Canid, and、uh, Tehran, Baghdad. You know, those were all under the Mongol rule during the Eocanid, while Samarkand, and、uh, you know, those Central Asia that belonged to the Chaktai, and、uh, Beijing. You know, those were under the Yuan, Yuan Mongol rulership. So this Mongol Empire had a lasting impact on Islam. Islam. In China, because the Mongols brought Central Asians, Arabs, Persians to China, so they belong to their army. So when Mongol, when the Mongols conquered Persia, for example, they would enlist Persians in their army to conquer farther land. And、uh, <clears throat> when they come back. To conquer the Song Empire, the Song Empire, the Song Chinese Empire was the last major regime to be destroyed by the Mongols. The Mongols first conquered the Muslim region, and then came back to China. They first conquered the northern part of China, and then conquered westward. And after that, they came back to conquer southern China. So when they came back to China. Ready to conquer the Southern Song, in their army, there was a ethnic kind of diversity of different different、um, people of different background. So for those soldiers attacking the Song Mongol, uh, uh, attacking the Song Empire in the Mongol army, there were Arabs, there were Persians.、Um, There were, you know, a lot of Muslims. <clears throat> so those people, after the Mongols conquer Song China, those Muslims didn't go back to their homeland. They stayed in China. And、uh, today, those people became known as the Hui nationality. So that's what these red dot you are looking at. They are everywhere. These were the descendants of the Muslims brought from Central Asia and West Asia by the Mongols in the 13th century. And the today they were no longer speaking Persian or Arabic. They were speaking Chinese, but they they still maintained their religion of Islam, and they became known as the Hui. And those are the Muslim living in China proper. Well, there was a major Western region, and you might have heard Xinjiang province in the recent news, and in the Xinjiang province. That is, the majority were Muslim, and those Muslim are known as Uyghur. Uyghur was a Turkic-speaking people, and、um, they are related to、um, the Turkish. And、uh, <clears throat> you know, we know in the ninth century. That area was still Buddhist, but since the tenth century,、um, Islam start to be accepted wider and wider among the Uyghur. So gradually,、um, they became Muslim, and、uh, especially after the Yuan Dynasty, those Turkic Uyghur also. Became Muslim.、Um, that had less to do with 
the conquest and um, but have more to do with the gradual kind of Eastern expansion of, uh, of Islam after the Tang Dynasty. So we are going to look at Chinese architecture, compare them, compare the Islamic architecture in China proper, mostly Hui architecture, and then we will also look at um, Islamic architecture in the Western region of today's China, and those are mostly built by the Uyghur. <clears throat> so Islamic architecture and Chinese architecture share a lot in common, actually, even though in terms of material, they are quite different. Chinese architecture, wooden, and Islamic architecture use mostly masonry. Um, but you know, Islamic architecture basically adopt local technology and form for the construction of their uh, place of work for worship. <clears throat> so um, on the left is the mosque of Ibn Tulun um, in Cairo, which was built in 879. And on the right um, is the Nanchan Si Monastery we just looked at from 782. Um, in both Islamic tradition and the Chinese tradition, courtyard was a key element. Uh, Islamic architecture also used courtyard to define a space uh, for worship and for gathering, for prayer. And both architecture also highlight ax axiality and centrality. The central building, like in this case, we have this um, pavilion for, um, you know, fountain uh, pavilion for ablution. And uh, it is located um, on the axis in the center of a courtyard. Um, so here I'm showing you on the left, we have the Dome of the Rock from the late seventh century. On the right is the Temple of Heaven um, in Beijing from the 15th century. And both buildings featured a centralized plan, um, kind of using circle and using kind of octagonal shape, geometric shape. And also another similarity is, um, you know, the difference is so obvious. Um, so I'm just highlighting the similarities. Another similarity is that uh, both the Chinese architecture and Islamic architecture use paint um, on the exterior. So they're, um, you know, use color, I should say, not necessarily painted, sometimes a mosaic, sometimes colorful tile, but their, their um, uh, architecture um, is kind of, um, colorful, the color were used uh, to decorate the wall. And in the Chinese case, um, paint were used. And in the case of the Dome of the Rock, it was the, um, the colorful tile. Um, courtyard organization on the left is the Great Mosque of Cairo and um, from the ninth century and on the right is the 15th century forbidden city. Uh, both use courtyard to organize their space. Uh, <clears throat> but of course they're, the way the courtyard were created is, is quite different. The Chinese use basically individual pavilion type connected by corridor to create those uh, courtyard. While the, in the Islamic case, in the case of the uh, Cairoan um, mosque, um, the courtyard was not created by those pavilion type. You don't see individual structures uh, grouped together to define a courtyard. Rather, it is quite continuous, uh, like one block and carve out a, a courtyard. But the Chinese case, you see very clearly, you know, there are individual pavilions and then there are connections to define a courtyard. 
but both, both use Cartier. So this kind of a mutual shared uh, spatial convention and architectural convention uh, facilitate um, the kind of mutual borrowing um, between Islamic architecture and Chinese architecture. The contrast between the uh, Islamic architecture in China proper and Islamic architecture in Xinjiang is like this, all right? So on the left, that is a mosque in Tianjin. Tianjin is a city next to Beijing. It's very close to Beijing. And that is a mosque. And on the right is a mosque from Turfan in Xinjiang province. Um, so obviously they were adopting different pre-existing architectural models. This is another feature of Islamic architecture in general. Islam adopt local tradition for the construction of their own place for worship. In China proper, they use traditional Chinese timber structure. In Xinjiang province, they use Central Asian tradition, pretty much developed from the Persian tradition using those monumental arches called the Iwan <coughs> and building those um, minaret um, in symmetry and pairs. While in China proper, they adopt the wooden um, structure that created a mosque hardly differentiable from a Buddhist monastery, except you go inside to look at the inscriptions and you find Arabic inscription, right? Okay, so I think um, we are going to stop here today.